Thank you for joining. The workshop will begin in about one minute. All right, let's get going. Welcome everyone. I'm so glad you all could join us today. Um, I'm Katie Brooks, I'm the CEO of the Ben Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here to introduce Mo Carrick for day two of her fabulous sessions on how we can help ourselves and each other get through this pandemic in the workplace and otherwise. Um, I'd like to first of all, start by thanking the Central Oregon Health Council for their generous grant in bringing this to you. Um, they identified this as something that was really important and, and definitely the pandemic is wearing on us all in a lot of different places and the workplace is definitely one of those spaces that uh, I know we've been all feeling it. So we're so glad to have Mo Carrick with us today. Now she's a nationally known consultant, Bendite, and author, speaker and adventure seeker. Her work is dedicated to solving the world's biggest problems by creating great leaders, healthy partnerships and resilient organizations. And I'm so thrilled that she's with us today and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mo, go ahead. Awesome, thank you so much, Katie. Good to see you and hi everybody. Looks like we're getting up to about what we were expecting for today. And um, thank you to the chamber for hosting me and hosting this session. And thank you also to the Central Oregon Health Council um, for powering these sessions. I'm super, super grateful for it. Um, I would love to see in the chat if any of you attended yesterday. Today's different. We're gonna to touch on some similar themes and there may be some duplication, but it'd be helpful to me to know sort of how many people were here yesterday. And, um, and if you're new to today, no problem. You don't have to have attended yesterday. I'm just trying to um, get a better sense so that I don't duplicate um, too many things for you. So um, I'm so glad that you're here. And let me give you a few logistics to our time. So we're gonna to be together for two hours. We're going to take a break about midway through and uh, just a body break, a short body break. I can't see you, but you can see me, which is not my favorite format, but it'll totally work for today. But we have the chat, which is awesome because in the chat, we can communicate with each other. I can see where you're at and I can see what you're reacting to. Um, that I'm sharing and that I'm talking about. So, um, so keep the chat open if you would and keep it alive. We also are gonna have some time for questions and, um, and you can raise your hand if you have a question and we can even put you on the screen so you can ask your question of me directly, which Madeline will help with. Um, and that's super helpful. We'll, we'll probably have at least two sections for questions. So you might be thinking about uh, questions now already as we as we jump in. Um, the team, Madeline and Finn are reminding me that if you want to respond so that everybody can see it, make sure you put panelists and attendees. If you just say panelists, only I and the other chamber staff will see it. And um, that's helpful so that then everybody can see what we're talking about. And if you want to send something private to me, you can do that the, the, to me and to the, to the chamber team. So, um, so that's it for logistics. If for some reason you can't hear me or I'm playing a video or an audio and you can't hear it, then um, please, please weigh into the chat just as soon as possible because then I can fix it and we can fix it. So I do want to open, for those of you that were here yesterday, I do want to open with the same video that I shared yesterday. I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, and so if you guys already were part of this, then you're, you know what's coming. And if you're new, this is my way of saying thank you to you. Um, and to also enter the topic of what we're 
what we're going to be talking about today. And before I show this first inspiring video, I want to thank you for being here. You are here. You did it. You somehow managed to push back all the things that are pressing on you for two hours of investment in you. And I'm so glad that you did. And it's hard to do. We have a lot of things pulling on us from home to work, multitasking, et cetera. And I want you to try, if you can, to give yourself permission now to be here now. Maybe have a notepad next to you where you can take some notes, things you want to remember. We're going to share some resources afterwards as well. But um, it's easy in this virtual format when we can't be together in person to multitask. I'm guilty of it too. And of course, you get to do you today. But I promise you that today's session will be more valuable for you if you choose not to multitask. If you choose to take in a deep breath right now and say, you know what, I'm going to show up for this two hours for me to take care of me and to try and be well right now. So, uh, so thank you for being here. This, um, oh, I just realized that I might not have checked my sound video here. So I'm going to do that. Oh, I did. Okay, great. So um, let me go back to the screen. This short video is from a song that Alicia Keys put out right when COVID hit, and it's been re-recorded by a children's choir, um, an international children's choir. And I want to offer it to you today for the work you're doing and the work we're doing together, in particular, as we continue to be challenged with our COVID-19 scenario and world of work as well as all the other challenges we're all facing at a you know, meta and micro level. So consider this a personal thank you to me. And, um, and I encourage you to feel whatever you want to feel um, as you're watching this and noticing and entering our time together. Disguise my hero. I see your light in the dark. Smile on my face when we all know it's hard. There's no way to ever pay you back. Bless your heart, no, I love you for that. Honest and selfless. I don't know if this helps it, but. Good job. You're doing a good job, a good job. You're doing a good job, don't get too down The world needs you now Know that you matter, matter, matter Yeah You're doing a good job, a good job You're doing a good job, don't get too down The world needs you now Know that you matter, matter, matter Yeah Six in the morning as soon as you walk through that door, everyone needs you again. The world's out of order. It's not a sound when you're not around. All day on your feet, hard to keep that energy. I know when it feels like the end of the road, you don't let go. You just pray. The engine that makes all things go, go Always in disguise, my hero I see a light in the dark Smile in my face when we all know it's hard There's no way to ever pay you back Bless your heart, oh I love you for that Honest and selfless, selfless. I don't know if this helps it, but Bye. 
So much to our first responders, our healthcare workers, our mothers. Thank you to our moms and our dads. Thank you to our teachers who've helped us. We know it's been hard, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Well, how you doing out there? I'm losing my cookies over here. <clears throat> so if we were in person, I probably would be doing this too, but here I am sobbing and um, I apologize for that. It happens every time I watch this video. And in particular for me, just so you have a little context to why I'm the presenter and I'm losing my cookies over here. Um, it touch, that video touch, touches me because we all come to work every day and we wanna do a good job. And this year it's been hard. And if it's been hard on you, I feel you and I see you. Today is also an important day for me, which is why I think I'm super emotional. Um, because I'm moving my mom today. My mom's 85. And I'm moving her into assisted living today. And um, she's done a good job. And it's hard to have a transition like that. So I apologize for my momentary lapse. But I'm going to try to walk my talk because we're gonna to talk today about vulnerability and about emotion. And I know that even as I show up in this session with you all, I'm also emotionally navigating my own challenges. So whatever you're carrying today in the spirit of me going first, <laughs> bring it, bring it because we're in this together. We're in this together. So thank you for bearing with me as I, uh, as I gather myself. Um, it, it's uh, my mom has worked hard her whole life and being not independent, being um, interdependent has been very, very difficult for her. And uh, I'm so proud of her for today for making this move to let us help and to let people help her. So it's a good day uh, for us. And it's also, um, it's also an important one. And I'm aware that you're coming today with your own story. So let me encourage you to take a deep breath. Some beautiful things coming up in the chat. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me. I wish I could see you. And most of all, I wish we could be in person. Um, I can't wait until we can gather again in person. It's not the same across the digital format, although we do the best that we can. And I'm so glad that you're here, even, even though it is virtual. So please take a deep breath, bring air into your lungs and fill it up because we're gonna jump in. And I'm hoping that today, even though it is um, this format, the webinar format, I'm hoping it'll be a little more like going to the gym than going to the movies. Cause I'd like you to do some work. We're gonna talk about resilience. And I want you to be thinking a little bit about your resilience and making some commitments and coming up with some ideas of how you're going to work on your own self-care and your own resilience at work and at home. So if you're planning to like sit back and just watch movies all day with me, let that go because I want this to be more like the gym than the movies because this work takes our focus and our concentration and our energy and effort. So thank you again so much for being here. I'm going to share my screen again. Now we're going to jump into a little bit more content. Let me make sure the video doesn't play again. So, you know, how are you doing is sort of the question. The topic today, um, the reason you signed up probably was from the description of the topic that came from the chamber around self-care and work. Yesterday, we had a very similar session. We covered some adjacent topics, but we were more focused on the role of leadership and the role of employers in creating resilience in the workplace, which is my 
home space, it's what I work in, um, is how to help leaders in particular create in vibrant and engaged cultures and communities so that their companies are fit for human life. Um, you might be a leader today in this session, in which case I'm glad. I actually believe that we can lead from any position, whether we have the title or not. So you are a leader in your realm. And if, if you are not a formal leader, welcome. And if you, um, if you are a formal leader, welcome as well. But we're not so much focused specifically on leadership today. We're focused on self-care and work. And um, it's, I don't know about you, but it's challenging in these times. And so I would love to see, I'd love to fire up the chat. We have 50 something people, 54 people or so on the line. And I'd love to fire up the chat and have it come alive with how you would answer that question. How are you doing? I'm looking for a word or a phrase that describes this moment in time. Let's just see and check in even virtually about how we're doing. You saw some of how I'm doing. I'm feeling a little fragile. I'm feeling a little sad, but also relieved. Oh, I love it. Here they come. Gratitude, content, hanging on. Thank you, Sandy. Adrenaline button for almost a year. Oh, Katie, I feel you. I feel buried, says Megan. I feel overtired, Addie. My gosh, with a new baby, scattered, overwhelmed, content and fractured. I love the paradox of that, Marissa. One day at a time, grateful, maintaining, hurried, tired, positive, awesome. I'm scanning to see if I missed any scattered, buried. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I feel you. See you. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Overwhelmed, but helpful. Sustaining. I love that word. Good job. Good job. So whatever it is that you're feeling and however it is that you're doing, it's okay. It's valid and it's okay. Liking my life, but fearful for the future. Thank you. We're in an ambiguous ambiguous time. We're tapping into strength. We're overwhelmed and hopeful. We're feeling all of these paradoxes right now. So thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And I'm going to keep asking you as we go along about how you're doing, how you're doing at this moment and how you're doing as we look forward into the future. What's true around the country and around the world is we're actually not doing so well. We're not doing so well. These are some statistics. This slide might be a little hard to see, but from a mental health perspective, we are not doing so well, especially here in the US, but elsewhere as well. Even before COVID-19, 19% of adults experienced mental illness. Right now, it's up to 28%. Suicidal ideation is increasing among adults. Many have an unmet need for health insurance. Youth suicide and severe, de severe depressive episodes are higher than ever. Youth, youth suicide is at an all-time high. Um, we have a lot of challenges and there's been some recent studies in the workplace as well of leaders and of employees who are suffering from stress-related illness, physical illness, as well as mental health challenges ranging from mild anxiety and depression to severe mental health issues and um, uh, including suicidal ideation, psychosis and the like. So COVID-19 has been hard and mental health was an issue prior to COVID-19. So I wanna um, share with you another little video. I'm gonna use video and audio throughout the session today. This is from a movie that was, uh, what, it came out a couple of years ago, a little, a little trailer. You might wanna watch the whole document, the document, I can't talk, the documentary. But for now, we're just gonna watch the trailer from a little film called Beyond Silence. And it sort of features um, some of what I'm hoping we can tap into today as we look at self-care. And yes, we are talking about the workplace. We are talking about the workplace. So let's, uh, let's listen a little bit to this clip, which includes some non-workplace examples, but I want you to be thinking of it in the context of your workplace and how mental health may be resonant and relevant at work. We're going to the woods, you know? I thought all I have to do is move places and that would be the solution. But the fact is, my brain traveled with me wherever I went. Things don't seem strange to you if they're happening in your life. It generally produced what many would consider the embodiment of success. Perhaps that's why I was able to hide it so well. I started thinking that I could have conversations with people in my mind. It was a rough time. 
but I was believing that it was a normal time that everyone has experienced that we just don't talk about. Am I accepting that my life ends here? But for me, it was more like, what does life look like after this? For 21 years, I was living with bipolar without anybody knowing it was bipolar. I lived in isolation and alone for most of my years of sickness. I could not give him permission to uh, take his own life. That's, that's too much to ask your father. When I was at my worst, I would see them and something would change with, with my thoughts. In a weird way, it almost felt like a key was being unlocked. This isn't just something I'm unable to handle. My dream is to not be forgotten by my kids. That's, that's my dream, man. I just want to be a good husband, a good dad. That's really my dream, man. I know what it's like to have lost your voice, and I want to be the voice for those that can't speak up for themselves so others will see that they're not alone. When we connect more with us being human, I think that what happens with the mental illness is it shrinks. It's being willing to say, I'm not afraid of who I am. So little, um, little bit, little documentary, the whole documentary, I think is about 20 minutes long, but it's got some really powerful stories and examples. And I wanted to show that as we launch into this session today, because I want us to stretch our wings with talking about mental health as a dimension of self-care. My husband and I were talking the other day because we were watching a 60 minute special about a woman who had survived a really, really hard cancer. And um, she they was talking about her treatment and stuff. And I, I, was, I was having trouble um, watching. I was having trouble watching the, the, the episode. And my husband said, you know, why, why is this struggling? You know, why is this a struggle for you? Um, he's a two-time bad cancer survivor. I myself am a cancer survivor. I don't like and can't stand cancer. And I'm impacted by it as well. But what I realized as I was watching this story was that I'm troubled by how easy it is sometimes to talk about cancer and how hard it is to talk about mental illness. I wrote a blog about that at one point, which was titled, it's easier to talk about cancer than it is to talk about mental illness. And we need to change that. And we need to change that at work because just like we come to work with all of our health related strengths and issues, we also come with our emotional and mental health strengths and issues. And if I had a child or a friend that was diagnosed with diabetes, or someone was in, my, in the cubicle next to me at work or in the desk next to me at work and they had a diabetic reaction because they had failed to take their insulin, I would provide care for them. I would get them the medical help they needed. And when I saw them the next day, I would say, how are you doing? Is everything okay with your diabetes, with you? But yet with mental health and with mental health at work, we tend to not wanna talk about it. We avoid it. I personally am impacted in my family alone we have right now at this very moment, I have family members and close friends who are struggling with anxiety, depression, loneliness, addiction, borderline personality disorder. That's just me. How about you? <laughs> right? There is a lot of dimensions to mental health and mental well-being ranging from mild to severe and we have an underutilized capacity to talk about it especially in the context of work so we're going to focus on all dimensions of self-care today but in particular i do want to highlight the emotional well-being that's happening at work and the mental health and well-being of how you're doing um, many years ago it's probably gosh, 30 years ago, I was reminiscing about this with a colleague from that time. Um, we were working with a client. It was a BMW of North America. We were doing leadership training. We worked with a, a really 
great team. We were driving race cars around the track, teaching leadership in BMWs. It was really fun. And our partner on the client side at that time was a very ambitious, very uh, type A, really smart um, senior leader. He was an executive with BMW North America. And about two years after our program ended, we learned that he had suicided. And that was the first time I had a client who had committed suicide. And since then, sadly, I've had many more, which has caused me to turn towards the dynamics of mental well-being as a critical part of business success. So, um, so stretch your muscles. I'm thinking and talking about it as we jump into our content for today. Let me put my slide deck back up. Sorry, I keep jumping you back and forth here. Um, now, why am I not able to, ah, there we go. Nope, nope, nope. I don't want that. Sorry, folks. I'm having trouble getting my, let me do this. Let me stop my slide deck. Technical issues on my side. There we go. My computer was stuck on something. Okay. Now I'm qualified. It was stuck on that video. Here we go. So let's look at what we're going to focus on today. Saw the write-up in our in the program on the chamber. In particular, I want to focus on three things. We're going to spend a little time. We already have understand the impact of 2020's challenges and 2019 on you and on your team and what you might do next with some ideas. A focus being on some ideas for how to move resiliently into 2021 and through 2021. We're going to reflect on how to show up and how to navigate emotional well-being, mental health, and burnout while also building resilience. And this of course has to do with your physical well-being as well. We're hoping to help you be well and to help your team be well. Because when you're well and you're doing well at home and at work, your business or your organization, your nonprofit, your school, your kids, everybody does well, does better. So we're gonna start with the focus on you right now, today. Now, I'm curious about how many of you might be feeling burned out. And um, Madeline, I'm going to get your help. We want to do a little poll and I'll stop my share here so that Madeline can share the poll um, to see how this group is doing around burnout. So to what degree do you right now feel signs of burnout? The ones I just showed on the screen, depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, or diminished sense of personal accomplishment. Do you feel it unrelentingly right now? often, sometimes, rarely, or never. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer here. I just wanted to get a pulse for this group and how we're doing. So go ahead and respond. We'll let the majority come through. Depersonalization, thanks, Marissa. Depersonalization is a tendency to kind of um, keep yourself at an emotional distance from what's happening. It's sort of like we become depersonalized when maybe we something happens and it feels like it's happening to someone else, not really to us. It can, can also feel like numbness. Depersonalization can feel like numbness as well. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Marissa. Great. We'll give it another, another minute, 30 seconds maybe. Great. Looks like we're getting close. Madeline, I'll let you call it. When you think we've got the majority, perfect. Excellent. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close it. Now, oops. Madeline, can you share the results again? Or maybe I can. Oh, I can. Oh no, can you guys see the results? Can everybody see the results? Yes. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, so the highest vote getter is often. We have a group of people right now who are often feeling burned out. Some of you unrelentingly, I'm sorry for that, I feel you. Some of you are feeling it sometimes and a couple are feeling rarely and nobody's feeling it none. Um, thank you. So experiencing feelings of burnout, experiencing some of those things that are listed, depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and a diminished sense of personal accomplishment is really common right now, 
right? Um, as Eric said, we're, we're enduring more than we ever have before. And if you're not feeling those things right now, it's okay. It doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. You may be doing some things that we can learn from in terms of being resilient. Um, and you may have felt it in the past or you may be feeling it tomorrow. Most of us go through burnout as a normally occurring dimension of, of work and of life, but sometimes a more intense than others. And of course, the number of stressors on us all this year is, are enormous. So that inventory that I shared, the Maslach inventory was originally done studying healthcare providers. Um, and it has been since extended to other populations. But this was, um, in a, this was a study that was done a number of years ago in an attempt to better understand provider burnout. And some of you work in healthcare and you're probably seeing we've had a crisis of, of burnout um, in healthcare for a number of years. And um, we are of course now seeing tremendously high burnout in other sectors, education being one of them in COVID-19, um, but other sectors experience it as well. So I'd love for you to think about and maybe jot down on, a, on your notepad or piece of paper next to you or just consider these two questions. How do you want to show up for the year ahead for yourself and for others? And the graduation hat that's there is just sort of meant to, simula to, to stimulate the idea that we're in a new period, right? We're sort of graduating from 2020. And I don't know about you, but I had my hopes set on 2020 kind of ending and things sort of feeling new in 2021. And here I am in February noticing that they, they aren't. <laughs> They're kind of pretty much the same um, with a lot of ambiguity about the future. Um, so one of the things that we spoke about in this session yesterday, which for those of you that didn't attend, I'll mention again, a colleague of mine by the name of David Lansfield published a nice piece in the Harvard Business Review that just came out on Monday about resilience for businesses in, in the 2021 COVID period. And one of the things he suggested, he had five steps for resilience. And one of them was around being willing to call it that the crisis is over. And what I think is powerful about that is that it doesn't necessarily feel like the crisis of COVID-19 is over. That's because like most crises, it doesn't really have a definitive end date, like a war or some other trauma, a tornado. It doesn't really end like, oh, that's over now. We can get back to things. So. Instead, we may want to think about giving ourselves permission to say, you know what, we, we, we are pretty much through at least that phase of the crisis, we're into something new now. And I really want you to think about and maybe jot down how it is that you want to show up for yourself and for others. This is not about judging yourself for how you showed up yesterday or last year, but also ask yourself the question, what do you need? What do you need from yourself? What do you need from home? What do you need from work? As you think about that, I just want to give you a minute to jot down a few reactions. All right, keep that handy. So even before COVID-19, this chart was one I used often, some of you might've seen it before, to think about how we approach our work lives and how many of you feel like you see yourselves in this little chart. The dark green is work and the light green is everything else. And um, if, you have, if you see yourself here, feel free to weigh in on the chat. I love, uh, I love noticing. That looks like my life, says Wendy. Yeah, absolutely. And this has only gotten worse is what I'm hearing. And in the research I've been doing in 2020, this has gotten worse during COVID, right? Um, <laughs> Maureen says, yes, except it's 11 p.m. Totally trying to get better at setting boundaries. A um, little less lighter color for some of you. Wow, wow. So. Our 24 seven access with our devices. And in fact, the pivot to virtual for many of you that are working virtually like me, the hours of work have become greater. And of course we see a very deleterious impact on COVID with uh, the invasion of work life boundaries being so thin with children at home, with schools closed, with elder people at home. And those statistics are disproportionately impacting women. Although of course they do impact men in the home as well. So this has some big implications for how it is that we're showing up and how it is that we're taking care of ourselves. And of course, there's many good things about the fact that we can work remotely and that we have these devices that allow us to connect virtually. That's wonderful. And we need to manage some of the dark side. But because we are spending so much time at work, it benefits us to notice what about work is helping us 
and what about work might not be helping us to be healthy and to be well. Now, I differentiate between happiness at work and thriving at work. I believe that they coexist, but they're not the same thing. And I always like to mention this because it can be easy to tell ourselves a story that we're supposed to be unrelentingly happy at work. Now, weigh in on the chat. Um, if you are an essential worker or if you've been back to work in a physical location during COVID, it's helpful for me to get a sense of how many of you are in that reality. Because really sometimes thriving at work is very different in COVID if you are at home or if you're going to work. There, there's pluses and minuses on both sides, but it's helpful to hear. The reason I like to, so some of you are working, um, yeah, combination of work. Some of you came into work consistently. Um, you've been essential through it all. Beautiful. You've been back to work. You've been doing combo, a lot of combo. Excellent. So you probably noticed some different challenges for when you're working on your location uh, as an essential worker or when you're working um, virtually. Yep. Good. This is great. Combination, healthcare, working, 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 says Misty. Yes. Yes, different kinds of stressors. Either case, and thank you for weighing in on that, what we want to move our mindset towards is thriving at work versus happiness because some days are just hard, whether we're on site as an essential worker or in our office or our location or we're working remotely, some days are hard and we're actually not happy. We're not meant to be happy at work every day. It's not a constant party, right? In fact, a constant party becomes not a party. <laughs> over a period of time, right? Instead, the language I like to use is that of thriving at work. What does it take to thrive? And I actually think that our modern uh, world of work has focused too much, partly due to the Silicon Valley effect, on temporally sensitive dimensions of sur like surface perks, things that can make us happy for a short period of time, like a latte machine on every floor or on-site dry cleaning right? Or um, wireless internet in the van to commute. Those things are not bad. They can create some happiness for us, but they don't really create the kinds of thriving that we want over a period of time. That feeling we have when we actually love our job, when we're feeling as though our job is enlivening us. Remember, again, how much time we spend at work. We spend more time at work if we're working full-time than we do with anyone else or anywhere else. So thriving at work becomes a concept that has really increased priority to our overall well-being because we're spending most of our time there. In my two books, Fit Matters, How to Love Your Job and Brave Space Workplace, which I happen to have a copy right next to me here, I talk about what we need from work. And this, these seven things you'll recognize if you ever studied in high school or college Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs because many of them were also evident in Maslow's hierarchy, but there are some differences. These are things that we bring to work as hope that work will fulfill them for us, okay? So we kind of carry these needs and expectations from work today. This is, this is relative to the modern world today. Number two is the basics, right? And it actually could be in the number one position because if the basics aren't met, it tends to stay in the number one position. The basics are our cash and non-cash compensation. That means that we feel paid fairly and that we can meet our basic needs with our income, which includes food, shelter, water, safety, and security, okay? So if we feel, feel paid fairly and we can meet our basic needs, that one actually falls in priority and the other six take their place. This is highly personal. What you need from work is very much up to you and your stage in life in your personal circumstance. You see, number one is listed as making our lives work. Boy, this has been challenging even in COVID, especially in COVID perhaps, with the blending of child and elder care needs, with changes in routines. I've had people participating in workshops with me, in barns, in cars, under tarps, right? Trying to make their lives work of working in a remote location and yet not having the infrastructure to do that. But making our lives work has to do with whatever it is we need to balance, our hobbies, our commute, our need for travel, et cetera, to make our whole life work. The third is to feel supported in taking risks. This is about psychological safety. And we're gonna talk more about it today as we look at team health. You'll notice it doesn't say to be safe in taking risks. 
That's because I actually don't believe that we can guarantee safety at work, just like we can't guarantee safety in day to day. Things happen, things happen. But what we want at our best is that we're supported by a team, and by an employer, so that we can take risks, we can have hard conversations, we can innovate and be creative. This is how we do our best. If you're interested, you might look up the Aristotle Project, which was Google's seminal research about team health and social capital, which is that feeling we have when we know that our team has our back. It's a powerful thing. The fourth need we bring to work is to contribute. This is about purpose, about feeling like we're contributing to something bigger than ourselves. We all have it and we bring it to work. Fifthly is the need to be seen and known. This is about somebody knowing our name, maybe knowing a little bit about our story. I often tell this story about my daughter. They were working in high school, got a job at Spork, a dishwashing job. And um, my daughter had had issues with school, had some anxiety. And when they got the job at Spork, they never were late every day on time. So I asked them, what's the key? What's the success? And they said, the thing is, mom, they're expecting me. They're expecting me, right? That's about being seen and being known and contributing. Both of those come into play. Sixthly is the need for learning. This is about growing and becoming better tomorrow than we were yesterday. We have that need at every level in every job, whether we're entry level or we're in the CEO suite. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly to our content today is our need for connection. Brene Brown says that as social beings, we are hardwired for connection. The reason why mental health, I believe, is such a crisis right now is because we are suffering greatly as a society from disconnection in terms of COVID, but even pre-COVID. Social media has created more disconnection. The United Kingdom in 2018 appointed a new minister of parliament. Their title is the Minister of Loneliness and their job is to reduce isolation in rural areas, particularly amongst their elderly population. Vivek Murthy, <clears throat> excuse me, who was the Attorney General or Surgeon General, excuse me, under Barack Obama, I believe he's in the Biden administration now as well, declared loneliness an epidemic here in the US and men suffer disproportionately from it. So we bring our need for connection to work every day. My sister has two developmentally disabled sons and she recently lost her job in COVID. My sister's a little older than me, but prior to that, she used to say to me, oh, I love the sanctity of work. And I would say, what do you mean? She said, it gives me a place to go where I can be seen without being a caretaker. Right? That's about the connection that you get that's separate sometimes from what you get at home. So you might ask yourself right now, which of these needs is the most primary for you in terms of work? And know that there's no right or wrong answer here, but some configuration of these priorities are what we bring kind of in our backpack to the workplace to say, this is what I want out of this job. So gone are the days when the most important thing was our cash and non-cash compensation. Not that that doesn't matter, it does matter but it's not what actually drives us to get up, get up out of bed every day, especially if we feel paid fairly and we can meet our basic needs. So for fun, just to get a sense of where the group's at, go ahead and put in the chat, which one of these needs feels the most primary for you right now? February, 2021, which one's showing up as the most strong driver for you to get up and out of bed? We'll just get a quick view of that. Beautiful, the basics to contribute, connection, not sure, contributing, contributing, a lot of contributing, connection, excellent, contributing, connection, number three, sub feeling supported, connection, contribution, need some seven, yes, to be seen, beautiful, beautiful, I love it, making my life work, absolutely, learning, thank you, Sammy, good, beautiful, bring it. Bring those needs. Now, I want to move into a little bit of content that I think might be helpful that comes from the work of Dr. Brene Brown. Some of you who know me or follow my work know that I'm certified in Dr. Brown's approach, uh, both the Dare to Lead curriculum and the Daring Way. Um, I do that work primarily with leaders in my practice and it's been transformative for me. I love this quote from Dr. Brown. 
no matter what gets done or how much is left undone, I am enough. It's going to bed at night thinking, yes, I am imperfect and vulnerable and sometimes afraid, but that doesn't change the truth that I am also brave and worthy of love and belonging. This need of, for love and belonging is a primary motivator for us at work. We saw it in those seven things. And my favorite mantra for myself is the one that's highlighted in gold in this quote, I am enough. I am enough. And so are you, exactly as we are. So before we go into the work with Brene, I just wanted to introduce to you this definition of resilience. I think I'm fascinated with the word resilience more than I ever have in the past in COVID. I was really curious about the definition. I'm familiar with the work of Carol Dweck and others on grit and resilience in the human performance movement, but I also wanted to understand what does it mean actually if we just look it up in the dictionary? And you can see that it's a physics definition and it primarily applies to metals. If we have any engineers on the, on the session, go ahead and weigh in. But it's talking about the capability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformation, deformation caused by compressive stress. So metal getting bent or compressed bounces back or not. Some metals have a higher tensile strength for resilience than others, so they're better to use for certain things. It's also an ability to recover from or easily adapt or adjust to misfortune or change. What we need to cope with the challenges of the COVID-19 environment at work and our lives in general is a capacity for resilience. And sometimes it's not even recovering our former size and shape, it's finding our new size and shape, right? Finding out what will it look like in the new world that I'm navigating in? How do we recover and adjust easily? This is the thread and the theme of our time together. Now, if you're familiar with Brene's work, you know that her research is about shame. If you're not, her research is about shame. She's a shame researcher by her own admission. And what her research points to is that in every organization and really in our homes and in our communities, we want the stuff that's on the left of this image. We want courage and empathy and trust and adaptability and accountability and inclusion. And we wanna have hard conversations. We wanna solve problems. We want resilience. But what gets in the way is the bottom right. Scarcity, fear, anxiety, and uncertainty. Scarcity is not enoughness. I'm not enough. We are not enough. I don't have enough. Fear is fear. <laughs> anxiety is anxiety. And by the way, anxiety is one of the most contagious of all emotions. So when we are anxious, others will tend to become anxious when they're with us, which is one of the reasons why navigating anxiety as part of resilience is so important. And uncertainty, feeling unsure what to do, living in paradox, living in turbulence is a challenge. And ultimately what we're all seeking Every day, not just from work, is love, belonging, and joy. Belongingness is feeling part of. And because we are social beings, social mammals, we're hardwired to live in connection with others and to feel like we belong. This is why inclusion and equity and diversity has become such an important, finally, and public topic in organizations large and small. Who belongs here? How do we create an environment where everybody belongs? Joy and love naturally are occurring side by side with one another. And I'm not just talking about love in the intimate sense that we might have in our home or our family. I'm talking about also the love of a job well done, the love of a team that I feel gets me or supports me in my work, the love of my job. So I wanna um, bring Brene into the room a little bit because in order to get at self-care, we need to rumble a little bit with vulnerability with vulnerability and, um, and understand the definition of it a little bit more. So I'm gonna invite special guests for you. We're inviting Brene Brown into the room to look through self-care at the lens of rumbling with vulnerability. The question I always get is, where do I start with vulnerability? Um, I'm willing to embrace the suck um, I am starting to believe that it's an important emotion to be able to deal with. And if we, if we want to be brave, where do I start? And the answer is always the same. Start with the myths. 
When I wrote Daring Greatly, there were four myths, but since doing all the leadership work, I now have six myths of vulnerability that we need to tackle if we're going to really be able to lean in. And I'll tell you why, because I mean, just wherever you are right now, look around. I mean, I'm here with what, 10, 12 people here that are helping me put this together. And raise your hand if you were raised believing that vulnerability was weakness. Think so every hand in here goes up, and I'm sure where you are too, like, yeah. But here's the weird part, here's the catch. Raise your hand if you were taught that it was important to be brave when you were growing up. Right, this is the rub. Like we were told, be brave, don't be vulnerable, but there is no courage without vulnerability. And so we have to bust these myths that keep us from being real and honest and authentic. So six myths, number one, vulnerability is weakness. We've talked about it a little bit, but let me let me dig into when we when when I first started the research outside of the leadership world, when I first started 20 years ago, and we started asking people, what is vulnerability? The answers ranged from the first date after my divorce, trying to get pregnant after my second miscarriage, sitting with my wife who has cancer, making plans for our toddlers, starting my own business, getting fired, having to fire someone saying I love you first. Look, there is no equation where that, any of those things, equals weakness. Is it hard? Hell yes. Is it uncomfortable? Brutally. Is it awkward? To the bone. Is it weakness? No. It's brave. It's brave to show up and let ourselves be seen. It's just not weakness. The, there are two paradoxes, though, that make it hard, is when we see someone being vulnerable, we're like, oh, man, yeah, vulnerability looks brave in other people, but it still feels like weakness to us. And number two, when I meet you, the first thing I look for, in, the first thing I look for when I meet someone is their vulnerability, their humanity, their authenticity, but it's the last thing I want to show you in me. So number one myth, just not the case, vulnerability is not weakness, it is our most accurate measure of courage. And in fact, I can say that now in an empirically based way because we have the Daring Leader Assessment, which is basically assessing courage by measuring how vulnerable you're willing to be. Then there's myth number two, I don't do vulnerability. Um, and one of my favorite stories about this, and it actually ties into another myth, um, I was, literally working with rocket scientists and doing this work on Dare to Lead. And a guy came up to me during a break and said, hey, I really, I like the work. I just want to tell you, I actually don't do vulnerability. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, I, I'm a payload engineer. If I'm vulnerable, shit falls out of the sky. And you know, and as a Houstonian, I'm like, yeah, like ixnay the vulnerability. Like I want to keep my front and backyard clear of crap falling from the sky. And I said, well, tell me more, like tell me tell me what the hardest part of your work is. And he said, well, it's not the engineering part, it's the leading part. I lead a team now um, and a pretty big team and that part is hard. And I said, what about it specifically is hard? And he goes like, well, I have a guy that's worked for me for the past, and I think he said a year, and qu three quarters in a row, his deliverables are completely off and now I'm starting to get in trouble because he's not doing his work. And I said, well, have you talked to him about it? And I, he said, yeah, but it's too hard. And one time he almost cried and it just, I can't do it. It just feels like, I don't know, it feels, Vulnerable? I asked. And he's like, God, yes. We all do vulnerability. Look, if you're watching this and you don't ever in your life experience uncertainty, feelings of risk or emotional exposure, then, you know, call me. We'll chat. But we're all vulnerable. The question is, do you do it consciously and knowingly or do you do it unconsciously? Do you do vulnerability with awareness or does vulnerability do you? That's the only question. And for this guy, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute as another myth, he confused systemic vulnerability with relational vulnerability. Like, yeah, I, I want, I'm not interested in, in vulnerable systems. I, I want surgeons and engineers and you know, security and internet protocols to be not vulnerable, but the people who are implementing and running those invulnerable systems must be vulnerable because when they're not, that's when we start hiding mistakes. That's when we start not owning things. That's when we start not giving people feedback who are making mistakes. Then 
your invulnerable system that you're trying to build is at the greatest jeopardy when the people running it refuse to lean into uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Myth number three, I can go it alone. Here's the thing. We are neurobiologically wired for connection with each other. It's why we're here. And the heart of connection is vulnerability. The one need we have that supersedes all of our needs is to be seen and known and loved. And if you're not vulnerable, you can't be seen. So you can't go it alone. It just, it, it's, you're pushing against biology. Myth number four, you can engineer the uncertainty and discomfort out of vulnerability. So this is the two pieces. One, don't confuse systemic vulnerability and relational vulnerability. And I spend a lot of time um, in, in, in technology, a lot of time working with engineers. There's a great story in the book about working with a group of very elite subsea um, engineers at Shell where we have to spend a lot of time really just pulling apart. I'm not asking for vulnerable systems. I'm asking for vulnerable real humans to build those systems because that's the best shot you have when people will be real. The second piece about engineering the uncertainty and discomfort out of vulnerability is, you know, I've seen a lot of people use my work in ways that is really for me kind of unimaginable, especially where they try to say, we can build an app or an algorithm for vulnerability so it's more certain. Um, I'm going to be vulnerable, but I'm going to test it first to make sure there's no actual risk involved. That bankrupts vulnerability by definition. Myth number five, trust comes before vulnerability. And people always ask me, like, I want to be vulnerable, but I need to really trust someone first. But how do I trust them if I'm not ever vulnerable? And the way I talk about it, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about trust, is trust and vulnerability is a very slow building and stacking. I don't meet you and say, look, I'm going to be, hey, nice to meet you, Kurt. Here's my deepest, darkest secret. Let's be best friends. That's, that's, that's tumbling. That's like the bad Jenga move. That's like pulling something from the wrong place. I just played a lot of Jenga over the holiday. So let me tell you, and it's life, in a life-size Jenga. So when it fell, it was like monumental. It was horrible. Anxiety, very bad anxiety for the Jenga. But we have to build slow like this. But if you're waiting till someone meets a trust test to be one ounce vulnerable, you're going to wait forever because trust needs vulnerability, vulnerability needs trust. The last myth, and this is the big myth, big myth, that vulnerability is disclosure, that vulnerability is oversharing. Like, why do I need to be vulnerable? Like, um, you know, I'm not going to tell everyone my, de my, my hard things. And, you know, people ask me all the time, like, I want to be a daring leader. How often do I need to cry at work? I'm like, whoa, um, yikes. I have met vulnerable leaders who disclose very little personally, but who are very vulnerable and open. And I have met leaders who disclose everything and are not really vulnerable at all. Vulnerability is not disclosure. Um, live tweeting your bikini wax, not vulnerability. Sharing intimate details of your divorce and you know on Facebook, not really vulnerability. Vulnerability is I'm showing up, I'm present, I'm leaning in, and I'm keeping the armor off. That's what vulnerability is. So it's really helpful to dig into those six myths of vulnerability and figure out which ones, which ones do you cling on to and what do you need to do to let go of them? All right. Well, um, I would love to see some reactions and thoughts to the Brene Brown video in the chat. And I'm also gonna tackle the question that Wendy asked right as the video came on, cause it's a good one. And now is a good time actually for us to do a little Q and A before we take our body break with anything we've covered so far that you have questions about. So um, Wendy asked about how does a leader deal with an employee who is not getting the seven needs met in the workplace? And, um, and she says, you know, though everyone else does, I can't fix it for her. And that's so true. It's so true. We as the employer or the leader uh, or the business owner can't fix our employees' um, happiness at work. 
What we can do though is recognize that those seven needs are at play and to support the employee with empathy, which we'll talk more about in a minute, as they try to get their needs met from the workplace and from you as an employer. And sometimes that means having that hard conversation of saying, you know what, I don't think this is the place for you or it's not the place for you anymore. Um, I don't think that every employer can meet all seven needs of every employee at every moment. Uh, we make trade-offs about those seven needs. So one way to get at that conversation, Wendy, might be to ask that employee what trade-offs she's making of what she needs for work right now and how's that working for her, right? Because sometimes the trade-off is really worth it. For years, I traded off the um, the difficulties I found with having an aggressive travel schedule as a consultant with the benefits of consulting for me, even though I didn't love being away from home or away from my children when, when I was a young mother. But it was worth it for me in terms of both my compensation, what I was learning, the clients I got to work with, the travel I got to do. Those trade-offs made sense for me for a number of years. Uh, but it wasn't that I loved that aspect of the work. Similarly, I remember dropping down to part-time when I was a young mother. I, I wanted to work full-time, but I also was trying to be present for my kids who were at that time three and young. And so I made a trade-off. So you could ask your employee maybe a little bit about what trade-offs is she making? How's that sitting with her? Thank you. Thanks for that good question. Um, Katie talks about the, you know, being opposite of what we've internally processed. Um, for many of us, how many of you are noticing this, right? That, um, you know, you, you may have been taught, I was certainly taught that to be vulnerable was to be weak. And so we have to undo some hard wiring to reframe that notion. I'm noticing another question about whether someone is actually being vulnerable. How do we pick up on authenticity? And, um, and it can be difficult to sometimes separate intention from impact particularly if it feels like there's ul ulterior motives around vulnerability. Um, here's what I would say about that question. Intention does matter, but what matters more is authenticity, okay? Most of us, by the way, we, all we know about ourselves is our intention. We don't know the impact we're having. So if I think that someone is intending to be vulnerable as a way of creating connection, I can maybe pick up that intention, but if they have a negative impact on me, then the vulnerability probably falls flat and I'm gonna to wanna to convey that. So what I think we wanna really think about per that question is that is two things. One is that positive intention does not sanitize negative impact. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> it's a little equation. Positive intention does not sanitize negative impact. Okay, the second is to remember that our intuition guides us in the realm of authenticity. Another way I think of that one is that we can smell a rat. This is why empathy can't be faked. Okay, this is why empathy can't be faked. If someone acts like they're being empathetic to my situation, I'm going to know what that is and I'm not going to believe them and I'm not going to feel supported. So we, it's helpful to tune into our intuition. And if we feel that someone is being kind of vulnerable as a show or vulnerable as a way of evoking a certain emotion, but they're not actually being authentic in how they're showing up in uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, then we can usually pick up on that. Now, let me pause there. Um, to just say another piece about that, because I get this question from leaders especially, but I get it from people who aren't in official leadership roles as well, which is how do I show up as a leader as vulnerable, but not be weak? In other words, I still need to be seen as a leader. I've had parents ask me this question too about parenting, especially when they have young adult children. How do I show up as the parent while also showing up in an open-hearted way with a vulnerability? And the key is that we do both at the same time. Right. So I, I heard an interview one time um, when COVID first started, actually, with a leader in the military. He was a retired general and he was someone the interviewer asked him, how did he handle the fear that he faced when he was going into battle with his troops? How did he handle his own fear and his own feeling of vulnerability amidst being a leader? And I loved his answer because he said, well, I'd have to do both at the same time. He said, my troops would think that I was crazy if I acted going into battle as if I was unafraid, because that would be foolish. 
Battles are scary and dangerous and hard. And people may die. There may be casualties. So I have to show up grounded in that vulnerability, that uncertainty. It's real and it's okay that I have fear. But I also need to show up as believing that a positive outcome will happen because that's what my employees need from me. So the same paradox exists, for example, as a parent. How do I show up as authentic and open-hearted while also being parental <laughs> around being grounded in our own confidence. So there is a paradox there. And as Brene said in that video, vulnerability is not just about sharing our deepest, darkest secrets. It's not about disclosure. It's about showing up in uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure in an authentic way to create connection, to create connection. Now, she said this early in the video, and I want to underline it a little bit because it's such an important point. We are drawn to vulnerability in others, and yet it's often the last tool we use to create connection. In fact, many of us find it very uncomfortable to be vulnerable. And I'll use, I need, no, I, I need look no further than myself today, right? As a speaker for this program, it was not my plan to cry when we opened this session. That's an act of vulnerability for me but my emotion rose and I did show some tears. And I still have mastery around the content I'm delivering and I'm still clear in my intention and the, the tears came and they went in a, in a moment. And that's how it works. That's how it works. We can be vulnerable and we can be leader-like. We can be vulnerable and parental. We can be vulnerable and grounded, okay? Because of what vulnerability is and what it is not. And again, we are drawn to vulnerability and it creates trust. It creates trust faster than anything else. Now, what often gets in the way of vulnerability, and this is my closing thought before we take a body break, is the presence of shame, which is why Brene Brown has landed so firmly on her research tying to vulnerability and courage because it's the antidote to shame. Now, shame is an emotion. It's an emotion, that's all it is. It's a human emotion that's common to all of us. It's universal. We all have felt shame. And it's that deeply painful feeling that we have when we feel unworthy of love and belonging. Shame is not the same as guilt, which is when we feel like we've done something bad, but we can fix it. Shame is that internalized feeling that maybe I am bad. It's that voice inside our head that says, who do I think I am, right? I'm not good enough. And shame and our fear of shame gets in the way when it comes to vulnerability because of how anxious we are about disconnection, about not being worthy of love and belonging. Now, the other reason these things relate for now is when it comes to mental health, there's a lot of societal shame and stigma about emotional well-being and mental health, especially in the workplace, but in society at large as well. In other words, that's why, for example, mental health is different than diabetes. Because if I talk about my diabetes, it's considered more socially acceptable. But shame is not associated with diabetes because most of us are able to attribute, you can be born with diabetes. And yet shame socially carries stigma when it comes to mental health, anxiety, depression, et cetera, or even stress-related illness. Yeah. I, there's another question that I'm going to answer because I, I promised you a body break. So I want to go ahead and, and let you break. And then when we come back, I'll answer this other question. And if on the break, you have another question, go ahead and put it in the chat. These are great. I love the questions. So um, let's take a five minute body break. And I see what time do we have right now? I'm trying to get to my clock. I see 12.09. So let's come back at about 12.15. Give you a little more than five minutes. Stretch your legs, hydrate, get something to eat. And I'll see you back here. And put your questions in the chat.
All right. Welcome back. I hope you're back. I'm back. So um, if you were multitasking or doing something else, go ahead and turn it off. We have just under, we've got about 45 minutes left and I've got a lot that I want to share with you. So, um, so thank you. If you do have any other questions, put them in the chat. I'm going to answer the one that came up before um, we ended. And by the way, just a reminder, if you want everybody to see your question, make sure you hit panelists and attendees. Otherwise, it's just coming to me and to the chamber staff. So either one is fine. I just, in case you wanted everyone to see it. So a question came up. It's a really good question. It's one I hear often in this work around vulnerability, which is, um, I'm worried. The question is something like, I'm worried about being vulnerable if others don't know that this is something that's helpful. If people aren't aware of what we're learning here about the value of vulnerability. And, and I totally get that fear. It's another way to state that is if I'm vulnerable and someone else isn't, or they don't think it's important, what will happen to me? And that's where we have to apply our best efforts at choosing the right situations and the right ways to be vulnerable, right? And so I use that example of the general. The general isn't, isn't in that moment when he's going into battle, he's not lying on the ground in a fetal position, crying and fearful because of how vulnerable he feels going into battle. If that were the case, he probably wouldn't be a four-star general. We handle our deepest, darkest fears with our support team at home to fortify us, to be brave in our day-to-day -day lives. And we can be brave and vulnerable at the same time. So to get at that question, let's say I'm being vulnerable and someone I'm partnering with at work or at home is not being vulnerable. They're armored up, they're self-protected. So for example, maybe I say, I made a mistake or I don't have the answer, or I'm feeling anxious. And they don't share anything about themselves, like that they've ever made a mistake or that they've ever feel, felt anxious. That's okay. It's okay if they don't choose to be vulnerable. My vulnerability will help that partnership by creating trust anyway, right? And again, in a contextually appropriate way, in a contextually appropriate way. And um, I have, in my lived experience, I will tell you this, I have not experienced my vulnerability ever leading to people judging me the way I thought they would. Because what often happens is because of those myths of vulnerability that Brene Brown spoke about is that we have more fear about vulnerability and about what people will think of us than we do, than, than, than is real, right? Because most of the time what people think of us when we're being vulnerable is, oh my gosh, it's powerful that she showed up authentically or that he showed up authentically. So I hope that helps with that question. We got a, a, another question about the difference between oversharing and vulnerability. Yes, I can share more about that. So oversharing is often, I like to think of oversharing as fast tracking for connection, right? Fast tracking for connection. Um, we've all done it. And we end up with sometimes a vulnerability hangover where we meet someone and you know, at work or at home, and we have a good vibe and we overshare about our personal lives. Something that's, that's maybe, too much for a new relationship. And then we end up with that, that hangover like, oh, why did I say that? Why did I share that? Oversharing is when we dig into personal details that are not really relevant to the situation or they're not about a vulnerability that matters. So I'll use an example of myself with my team and COVID-19, okay? Um, so I lead my team, I'm the CEO of my company. And when COVID-19 hit in March, it was devastating for my business. All of our events canceled one after another. And by about March 28th, the business had a big old zero on the books. I was highly anxious and I felt very vulnerable. Now I had five staff people, I still do, that worked for me. And um, I knew I needed to talk to them about our plans and I knew they were feeling destable. But I also knew that it wouldn't do me any good if I showed up to my team and overshared what was happening in the privacy of my own mind, right? Because that included some really crazy thoughts like, is the business gonna have to close? Am I gonna make it? Am I gonna have to fire everyone, right? Those were my deepest, darkest fears. Um, how am I gonna pay my mortgage if the business closes its doors, okay? That was some of my vulnerability. Who did I work that out with? I shared that with my close-in support team, my husband, my best friend. 
they are the ones that I can be face down in the dirt and just really be myself with my deepest, darkest fears. And they're going to love me anyway. Right? So vulnerability about those really scary thoughts with them was appropriate. But with my team, not so much. That would have been oversharing because it would have created anxiety for them. So how did I show up with my team? Well, I got grounded by getting some support from my home team. And then I did share with them how I was feeling, which is, this is scary. I also shared with them that I didn't know what the answer would be. But I also shared with them, in addition to the vulnerability I was feeling in that kind of concrete way, like, yes, this is anxiety producing. Yes, I don't have a firm plan yet. I also shared, yes, I believe that we as a team are going to figure it out and that I'm all in for figuring it out with you. I also was able to reassure them, I don't think you need to be nervous for your jobs, not right now, right? I think we're okay. We've been in business 20 years. We have a lot of clients. We can pivot some things to virtual. So I shared as well my leader-like optimism and some of my CEO presence. So that I hope that helps with oversharing versus vulnerability. The, in, at work, the most common times, types of vulnerability we're going to be sharing are, I made a mistake, I don't know the answer, or I'm sorry. Those are three of the most common ways we show vulnerability at work. Doesn't mean you can't share your personal details at work. It's just that we have very different um, privacy um, priorities. And I just need to remember, we need to remember when we're thinking about vulnerability that it's not about what we share. It's about the fact that we're willing to show up with someone in uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. That's with vulnerability, meaning there's no guarantee. So I hope that helps. The, the deeper content of vulnerability as a courage building skill is available in the Dare to Lead format. If you're interested in that program, we do have an open enrollment Dare to Lead program that's coming up probably in March or April. And um, if you want to get on my mailing list, you can go to mocarrick.com and you can sign up um, for that for that program if you want to learn a lot more about that. But I wanted you to have a bit of a taste of vulnerability so that you could get your head around it when it comes to self-care. Because one of the most important things we do when we're being vulnerable is to ask for help and to admit that we even do need some kind of help. Because what happens with vulnerability, especially in teams, is that it always is accompanied by courage. Vulnerability and courage are twins. Whenever we're being brave, we're usually also stepping into some kind of uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And yes, I'm going to share the resources um, after the program in an email. So thank you for reminding us of that to the chamber team. So when you think about self-care and what we're talking about here around wholeheartedness and vulnerability, I love this image of a three-legged stool from Dr. Brown, the three legs being cognition, feeling, and doing. Cognition is our thinking, our, our thoughts, our ideas, our wisdom, and our experience. Feeling, our affective side, is our emotion. It often feels like heart or gut, but it's our emotional realm, which also lives in our brain, but it's emotional. And doing is what we do. That's what other people can see, by the way, is our doing. They can see what we say. They can watch our feet, what we do. Ideally, as humans, we are integrated and we are balancing our thinking, our feeling, and our doing in an integrated way so that they match. We all know what it's like when they don't match. Have you ever had this happen on your team where you, you, you're working with a coworker or maybe they pop onto a Zoom call and you just feel, you just feel something heavy and you say to them, how are you? And they say, fine. And you're like, ooh, doesn't feel fine right? That's a way that we know that our doing and our feeling is out of sync. Because someone's saying, fine, the word is fine, but really the music behind it is clearly not fine. So we want to pay attention to that fully integrated sense of ourselves. And this little wheel, which I'll share with you after the session as well, I think is powerful when it comes to how we do well right now. Because most of us, when it comes to our emotional footprint and in the world of work, my lived experience is that we overemphasize knowledge and behavior. So thinking and doing 
and we underemphasize feelings. And that's true as a society, which is part of why mental health is such a crisis right now. But we sometimes are underutilizing our capacity to notice and talk about our feelings, our emotional states. This is also called emotional intelligence. So one of the simple things you can do to take care of you and to become more grounded, to take care of your team is to become more fluent in the language of your feelings. And this feelings wheel helps us do it. Because you can see at the center, the basic feelings most of us can describe, sad, mad, glad, <laughs> peaceful. But look at all the other feelings out there. Irritated, amused, worthwhile, sleepy, pensive, responsive, remorseful, stupid. All of those are emotions. And this is a powerful tool to keep present in front of us so that we can find words for those emotions. Remember, all of us as humans have felt all of these things. We, and when we're feeling something strong emotionally, it's usually a complex bundle of feelings. It's not just any one emotion. So be thinking about this tool to help you. So I have this equation I've evolved during COVID. Some of you saw this yesterday if you were with me, and it goes like this. Self-care plus team care equals a healthy, cohesive community at work and at home. And I came up with this because I was getting so many calls from clients who wanted me to do keynotes and to talk about self-care. And yet what I was seeing on Zoom calls and in conversations with clients was that it wasn't self-care that was the issue. It was the capacity they had for team care, for integrated care with one another. Okay. So, um, so think about that equation, if, if, if you will. Self-care plus team care equals a healthy, cohesive community. And I do see some more questions coming up, and I'm going to answer them shortly. But first, let me push through a little bit of this content. So self-care is about putting your own oxygen first. Let's deal with this first part of that equation first. Self-care. Putting on your own oxygen mask. You taking care of you so that you can help others. A key part of self-care is self-compassion. And I'm going to send you a resource in the follow-up from the website of Kristen Neff. This little slide comes from Kristen Neff's research. The site is called selfcompassion.org. Self-compassion, believe it or not, has three parts to it. One is self-kindness versus self-judgment. This is about how we talk to ourselves. For example, do we say to ourselves, good job, like we saw in that video? Do we say to ourselves, well done for trying? It's a bummer you missed that thing, but you made a great effort. Or you can do better next time. Or I see you. Or you've got this. Most of us, when we talk to ourselves, it sounds more like this. Who do you think you are? How could you be so stupid? What were you thinking? We need to find a different way to talk to ourselves. To talk. My New England upbringing shows up. To talk to ourselves with kindness rather than judgment. The second part of self-compassion is our common humanity versus isolation. Recognizing that we're not alone. Like that video we looked at about not staying silent about mental health. We are not alone in the challenges we're facing right now in COVID and at work generally. And then the third part of self-compassion is being able to mindfully look at what we're feeling rather than over-identifying it with it and over-identifying with it so that we can notice, boy, today I'm feeling blue. Today I'm worried that I'm going to make a mistake at work. Today I'm struggling to love my job, but tomorrow there might be something different for me. So trying to be mindfully aware that these moments of difficulty can pass. We don't have to change or fix ourselves. We can simply move through the moment. Self-compassion is a really, really important skill. I think of it as empathy for self. So some of you might be familiar with the work of Emily and Amelia Nagoski. There's a great podcast with them interviewed by Brene Brown, Dr. Brene Brown, in her podcast, Unlocking Us. That's how I learned about them. They wrote a book recently called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. And I wanted to share with you just a little bit of their model as we continue to think about self-care. They talk about the stress cycle being the moment at which our bodies learn that after facing danger, we're now safe. 
the completion of the full circle of stress. Our bodies need to complete the cycle. And of course, what's happening in COVID-19 times and sometimes in general is that we just go from cycle to cycle without completing it, which creates burnout over time. So the cycle looks something like this at its best, where we have a stressor, we then have a reaction, we process that reaction, and then we're more fortified for another level of stress. What many of us skip because of the way we work today, and because of our tendency to not take care of ourselves is we go from stress to reaction, from stress to reaction, from stress to reaction, and we don't give our bodies time to process the stressor. So one of the simple things you can take away from this content today is to give yourself permission to process some of the stressors you're experiencing. Because of course, the more changes we have at a time, the more stressors we may feel, right? And so we need to go through them kind of one at a time. The Nagoski's point to seven ways to complete the stress cycle, and you can see them on the screen here. And while I talk these through real quick, I want you to be thinking about what's your favorite of these in terms of how you become resilient, how you complete the stress cycle. And in a minute, Madeline's gonna put up another poll for us to get a little pulse check. But first, let me talk about each of these briefly. Physical activity, this is about moving your body any way you can. <laughs> Dancing, running, walking, fishing, doing yoga. Moving your body helps your body process the stress cycle. Remember, the stress cycle is a biological process. Our bodies process stress. It's our limbic brain response, our survival response that we have to process. So physical activity helps our body move through that stress cycle. Intense bursts of physical activity are particularly helpful. A second is your crew. This is about turning to your home team, your home team at work or your team in your community or at home to ask for help, to remind them that you need and benefit from support. It allows us to complete the stress cycle to turn to the people on whom we can depend to help us. Breath work or breathing is really powerful. And I have been, I've been a skeptic about breath work my whole career. Back when I was first in this business, transcendental meditation was very common and I was always poo-pooing it because <laughs> I didn't think it was very helpful. But um, I've changed my song now because I've really spent a lot of time with the research and I've come to see that deep breath work actually does soothe the limbic brain response. It allows us to facilitate the stress cycle. And I'm talking about either mindful meditation, you can use an app like Headspace. Somebody was talking in session yesterday about heart math, which is another way to practice some breath work. Um, you can do yoga or you can just practice four square breathing where you breathe in for four seconds, you hold it for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds and you hold it for four seconds where you kind of fill up your lungs in the back of your rib cage. This helps our bodies process stress. Laughter and crying, two sides of the same coin. Sometimes they mingle. Sometimes we start hilariously laughing and we end up in tears or vice versa. We're not talking about like just one tear. We're talking about ugly crying and belly laughing. Again, these are biological ways for our bodies to move through stress. Watch a funny movie. Give yourself a chance to just take a deep cry. Sometimes it really, really helps. In fact, it almost always helps. Remember when we start crying hard, we don't stay crying hard forever. It eventually stops, even in grief, even in grief. Affection is another way to complete the stress cycle. And in particular, the negotiates talk about a 20 second hug, holding yourself in your own gravity and hugging another person in an in a embrace for 20 seconds, which is a long time. Obviously, this may not be something that works well at work because we're not working with people and that may not be appropriate for the context of your relationship, but certainly with a friend or a family member to have that hug extend a bit longer than usual can really interrupt the stress cycle. And then lastly is creative expression. This could be anything from painting to sewing to building a, an engine to making a song list. Anything you do, writing a poem that is a way to creatively express yourself will help facilitate the stress cycle. 
So I'm curious, Madeline, with your help, we're going to put up a little word cloud. And I want to see which, how it is that you build resilience. And it could be from those seven things we just covered, or it could be from um, anything that you find helps you to build resilience. So Madeline, if I could get your help to share your screen with, this is going to be a word cloud. And you're going to be asked to just, uh, there's going to be a, in, in the chat is a link. And if you could, let's just quickly get a, a picture of what is helping you be resilient right now. And maybe it's one of those seven ways to reduce the stress cycle. Maybe it's something else. Just one or two words is great. And we'll just kind of watch this as it, as it forms. And while you guys are answering the question, um, and I see some coming up in the chat as well, self-care, faith, beautiful. And do feel free to put it in this mentee that Madeline's got going. There's a question that came up that I wanna answer as well, cause I think it's a really good one. How do you let in what's constructive? and not absorb criticism that gets in the way when you're trying to be brave. My recommendation about that is twofold. One is to really practice self-compassion because you're the most important voice to be compassionate to yourself. And another is to notice whose criticism are you over-indexing on and make sure it's not people in the cheap seats, right? Make sure that the people whose opinion you're really weighing in on matter to you. But often we pay more attention to somebody else's opinion, right? And we let that criticism come in and be absorbed. Yeah, great comment in the chat. Donna said, um, she asked the question, I can, I always ask, can it help me be better? Right? So asking when I get that criticism, can it help me be better? Is, is this person um, on my side? And then and then taking that criticism in context. All right, so look at our beautiful word cloud. Thank you. Laughter and family are the biggest ones that came up. And I'm seeing some other lovely things, cuddling with kids, my crew, um, nature, playing the piano, hope, meditation, running, reading, mindfulness, listening to music, beautiful yoga, belonging, support. Breathing, breath work, kids snuggles, spirituality, fresh air. Lovely. Writing, some good ideas. Hopefully you're taking some away. My dog, yes. For me, pets in COVID has been a huge part of my self-care cycle. Love, reading, journaling, silence. My soul tribe. I love it. Good. So thank you. Thanks, Madeline, for sharing that. Some wonderful ideas of additional ways that you can um, work on your resilience. So thank you for that. Let me share my screen again. So self-care, I, I want to, I'm going back to this equation. We, we've been looking at self-care. We've looked at self-compassion. We've looked at reducing the stress cycle. I also would be remiss if I didn't remind you about the basics. And I can't tell you how often I talk about this with clients in the context of work and work-related stress. What are the basics you ask? The basics are water, healthy food, sleep, and connection. Those are the basics. <laughs> Self-care includes those. I would add probably physical activity. When we do those things, it helps us be well and be grounded. And you know what self-care looks like for you. But it usually taps into some of those buckets, healthy nutrition, healthy fluid intake, rest. Sleep is so important to self-care, keeping ourselves mentally and physically alert and healthy and well and then physical activity. And then lastly, but most importantly, connection with people who care about you. So now let's look at the other piece of the equation, which is about team care. 
all of us are members of teams at work and at home. And there's some specific things that we can do to help our team be healthy that we have a part in. Knowing the emotional landscape of yourself and your team helps you to tend to fears and feelings. So I encourage you to be thinking about how can you notice and describe your own emotions, that's called self-awareness, and tune into the emotions of others, which is called other awareness. Both matter when it comes to fears and feelings. In the Dare to Lead curriculum, there's a particular skill set. It's one of the four current building skills in the Dare to Lead program. It's called Braving Trust. And I wanted to offer it to you here because I think it's a helpful tool set for how to contribute to a healthy team. Braving is an acronym and you can see it on the screen here. It stands for boundaries, reliability, accountability, the vault, integrity, non-judgment, and generosity. I'm going to come back to boundaries, integrity, and generosity, but let me mention the others first. The R stands for reliability. We contribute to team health by doing what we're saying we're going to do. And when we drop the ball, it does sometimes impact our trust. I did that recently. I promised somebody something by a certain date and I didn't deliver it. And I need to own and recover from that. Reliability is not the most important kind of trust. Vulnerability-based trust is, but it still matters. Keeping our promises. Accountability is that dimension of team health where we hold accountability. It's where we notice each other's contributions and imperfections. So that issue I mentioned where I dropped the ball with someone, that person gratefully as a member of my team brought it to my attention, holding me accountable for that. Accountability is what we agree to between us. And we do sometimes disappoint one another. We can be resilient through that, but it's important that we notice and hold the accountabilities that we make. The vault is about privacy and confidentiality. When someone on your team shares something with you that's private, keep it private unless you have permission to share it. And then non-judgment, we're gonna talk more about in a minute, but it's the ability we have to listen to a teammate or a colleague or someone at home without judging them as right or wrong or good or bad for what they're doing or saying. Non-judgment is a really important part of empathy. So let's look at my favorite part of the Braving Trust acronym is the BIG, the B-I-G. And um, we're gonna look at that in a second, but remember, I said earlier that anxiety is contagious. Remember that courage is also contagious. So one of the ways we be, co we be courageous and contagious about our courage is through BIG. So BIG is just a shorter version of braving. It's easier to remember sometimes. And it stands for boundaries, integrity, and generosity. And it's one of the ways we care for our team. Boundaries is about what's okay and what's not okay. We don't need them to be rigid, never-ending, inflexible boundaries, but we want them to be clear. An example is with my team, I try to honor the boundary of weekends being off with my team. So what's usually okay is that we work Monday through Friday. It's not okay that I or they are constantly circling work back and forth on the weekend. Now, do we sometimes work on the weekend? Yes, we do. But we try to be clear and consistent with when that's the expectation so that the boundary is acknowledged. Uh, this happened to me a few weeks ago. I needed to have a colleague do something for me on a Sunday. I said, I'm, I'm sorry to infringe on you. I said this to her on Friday. Will you be able to work a couple hours on Sunday because we have a deliverable on Monday? If not, it's okay. But can you? And she said, yes, absolutely, no problem. So boundaries are not rigid, but they're clear. Integrity is where we do what you say. We do what we say we'll do. And it's about living into our values living into our values. This is about walking our talk, okay? So we show integrity when we show up with our team in ways that are consistent to our values, our shared values and our individual values. And then generosity, my personal favorite, is giving people the benefit of the doubt. This is about assuming that people 
are doing the best they can, even when they're struggling. And generosity is hard because of our ten tendency to want to judge one another. But I know for me, it helps to think about generosity when I, when I remember how I feel when someone treats me as if I'm doing the best I can, gives me the benefit of the doubt. Now, it doesn't mean I can't do better tomorrow. I can, but that acknowledgement is really helpful. And if someone you work with is doing the best they can and they're failing miserably at their job, then something probably needs to shift. Either they're in the wrong job or they need some time off or something, but that doesn't take away from them doing the best they can in their job. So boundaries, integrity and generosity is a really powerful way to build team care and team trust. Remember that trust on a team is the baseline for a healthy, cohesive team. And we're talking about vulnerability-based trust there. Can we show up with each other in uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure? Can I show up with my team and say, I don't have the answer, or I need help with this, or I'm sorry that I missed that. Okay, so I hope you like big and uh, look, look forward to hearing how that might work with you. Now, I want to share with you another tool for team health. And if you've been around me in other programs, you know that this is one that I'm kind of mad crazy about. Um, and it's empathy. <laughs> and empathy is about feeling with, and it's different than sympathy. It's very different than sympathy, which is feeling badly for. Empathy has four parts to it. You can see them on the screen here. We added a fifth from Kristen Neff, which is mindfulness. But all that emp empathy means is perspective taking, staying out of judgment, recognizing emotion and communicating emotion. That's all it is. It's feeling with. Let's break it down a little bit. Perspective taking is believing that someone's story is true and real for them. Doesn't mean we have to agree. It means we believe them. Staying out of judgment means we don't have an opinion about whether it's right or wrong whether they are good or bad. Recognizing the emotion that underpins that is being able to tune in to what they're feeling and then to communicate and connect that emotion to our own experience of that emotion. We don't have to, been, we don't have, to have been through someone's actual experience to connect to the emotion that underpin it. And you'll notice that the fifth step is not problem solving in empathy. It's mindfulness it's being able to hold space. Now, let me give you one quick example of a time I saw empathy done really well. This was a, um, a situation where a team had experienced uh, fraud. It was a small business and there someone had been stealing from the till, basically. And the person who had been stealing from the till was caught by another employee. They were looking at some books and noticed that this employee had been stealing money and the boss was out of the country. So that employee had to navigate that situation and had to call the boss and then had to sit with that employee and tell them what they had discovered, which was that there had been theft and they knew that they had been stealing money. And when that employee did that, this coworker sat with her fellow worker, tough situation. The boss was on speakerphone and said what had happened. And the employee who had stolen the money was emotionally very devastated, felt very guilty about what had happened and own, did own it, didn't deny it, owned it, had had a personal series of misfortunes that contributed to the theft and was very emotional about it. And this coworker sat and listened to that story and demonstrated empathy. And what she said was basically, I can only imagine how hard that is for you. Thank you for sharing with me what you're going through. She stayed out of judgment about the theft. She recognized and communicated the emotion. She knew how it felt to feel guilty and even ashamed when you've done something wrong. And she basically said that. She said, I know what it's like to do something you regret. And she just held that space. And then she and the boss who was on the speakerphone communicated what would happen next, which had to do with some legal implications. But they didn't jump in to fix or remediate or take care of the problem for this employee. 
they actually ask the employee, what do you think happens next? Which is a beautiful question. And the employee said, well, I think you probably let me go and there might be legal action. They were like, yes, that's true, right? But I offer that story, not so much about what happened with the theft, but to underline the beautiful job that that coworker and the boss did with being in empathy and staying out of judgment. So with each other at work, one of the biggest gifts we can give for, for resilience and for well-being is to be in empathy with one another. Doesn't mean we don't hold accountability, we do. But we start with empathy, which creates connection. Dude. Let's skip that. Now there's one more piece that I wanna share with you and then I wanna give us some time for another couple of questions before we wrap. This comes from a TED talk that I'll share with you. Dr. Jody Horton, I believe is her name. No, I've got, no, I've got that wrong. I think it's Hone. Anyway, I'll send you her, her link. Gave a really powerful TED talk that touched me um, about the secrets of resilient people. She's a researcher about resilience and her talk was actually about her own experience with resilience after the death of a child. But she identifies these three characteristics of resilient people. And I wanted to share them with you as a final tool for self-care. The first is that they get the shit happens, pardon the profanity, but resilient people in her study and in Brene Brown's study and in other studies of courage and resilience indicate that the people that are the most resilient have an awareness and an understanding that bad things happen sometimes, things go wrong due to no effort of our own, which keeps us able to be resilient because we don't take, we don't have to take personal responsibility as if we are controlling the universe. It gives us more efficacy, more feelings of grounded confidence and more capacity to bounce back, to bounce back when we feel less like a victim and more aware that sometimes things go wrong and we can still be okay. Second is that Resilient people are really good at choosing carefully where to direct their attention, in particular on what they can control. Stephen Covey calls this the circle of control versus the circle of influence. Noticing that we can pay attention to where to direct our attention. And a good question already came up actually in our chat. Is this helping me now? Is doing this helping me now? which helps me be resilient. I was noticing a few months ago in COVID, I got into a bad habit of watching Netflix at night as a way of numbing. Has anybody done that? It's impacted my sleep, which is precious to me because I'm also menopausal. <laughs> and I was, you know, I liked the shows that I was watching. That was fun, but I was staying up too late and it wasn't really helping me feel better. So I asked myself this question, is it helping me feel better? And I was like, no, actually it's not because now I'm not getting enough sleep as fun as the show is then I'm grumpy and tired during the day. So it helped me to choose carefully where to pay my attention, which was, well, Mo, it's your choice if you watch Netflix till midnight, right? You can change that behavior and get yourself more well, more upright. And then lastly, resilient people don't diminish the negative that's happening, but they have a way of framing what's happening by tuning in to the good, by also noticing what's working, even if it's tiny, even if it's tiny. And one of the ways we can grow our own resilience and the resilience of our teams is to notice those tiny things that are working by saying, for example, thank you for that, that document, that meeting that deadline, contributing that thing. Thank you for asking me how my day was, okay? Tuning into the good, even though we know that the bad things are happening. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. I was going to say so I can see you, even though I can't see you. Um, and I want to just create a little bit of space. We have a few more minutes. I have one more thing that I want to share with you. But in the meantime, while we prep for that closeout, is, are, there, are there more questions that you have about self-care and team care? as you build resilience in this crazy post-COVID world. Anything we've touched on that you'd like to ask about? You can put it in the Q&A. You could put it in the chat. 
I'm so glad you're here and you're still here. Thank you for that. While questions are surfacing, I will mention that we have decided to, I'm gonna film a 30 minute version of these two sessions from yesterday and today for the chamber to share so that if people weren't able to watch it, they'll be able to look at a small recording with some of the highlights. Any other questions surfacing for you? Yeah, there was, I see a question. Oh, wait, I got a new question there maybe. Well, I, I think I answered the question about constructive and how do you let in what's constructive and not absorb criticism that gets in your way of being authentic? And I think we have to draw boundaries around that. Is this criticism helpful? Can I learn and grow from it? And is this someone who's on my side? We don't wanna give a lot of credence to criticism that comes from people whose opinions we don't care about because that tends to drive us into perfectionism which isn't helpful. Another question is about insight for those who have been working remotely and are gonna be getting back together. Yes, I love that question. We need to stage getting back together. I've been thinking a lot about kids going back to school and socially how hard that must be. My recommendation is twofold about how we get back together gracefully. One is that we make sure we understand what safety looks like in terms of virus so that people feel um, that they can be safe while we gather again in terms of contagion and immunizations and social distancing, masks, et cetera. And another that is that we, we go ahead and make sure that as we re-get together in person, we build in a little time for connecting as a team. Opening meetings with a check-in is a good way to do that. If you're a manager, having one-on-ones with people about how they're feeling about coming back to the office or back to work, and then hosting small but vulnerability-based team events that give people a chance to tell some of their story about what they've been up to this year that they've been apart. Because you're really rebuilding some relationships. Even though you've been on Zoom, it's different than being in person. So I think some structured time will really help, will really help. Um, will this be available to, or just the highlights? Just the highlights, but I am going to send you a host of resources after this as well. These are great questions. Um, let's see. How can you get out of the stress cycle when multiple stressors that you have zero control over present themselves? Mm, good question. And I, I feel you. I see you. That's hard. Um, hard one. One way that I think you can get out of the stress cycle is to practice those seven things, seven things that we just looked at for each stressful um, thing that you're focused on right now. So, so think about, for example, I've been thinking about this this week as I moved my mom. I'm going to be doing some interrupting of the stress cycle just around the transition of these last six months of getting her into assisted living. I'm going to try to take a weekend with my husband to recalibrate and rebuild. I've been doing some good workouts to help my me process through the process through the grief of what I've navigated with my mom and what she's been feeling. And um, I'm going to mentally kind of focus on some stress reduction on that particular issue. Um, that can help us to recover our equilibrium from that particular stressor. So even if you have a lot, I suggest focusing on each one. Uh, individually a little bit. Good stuff. Good questions. I'm going to put my email in the chat as well. And if you have other questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. And um, I will be sending these resources as well as some links for some additional resources. I publish a weekly newsletter called the Show Up News, and I plan to continue focusing on that as well. So I see another question about radical acceptance. You know, I am not 100% sure what radical acceptance means. So if, Marissa, if you want to define that, I can give you some thoughts. I've heard the term, but I'm not sure I'm grounded in what it really is. I think acceptance in general, yes. I think when we look at those three things that build resilience, I think acceptance is part of them, is recognizing what is being grounded in what is and recognizing what we can and can't control and accepting that I think is part of how we move through stressors. So um, it's a pragmatic piece, but I think, I think it's helpful. It's how we 
It's how we understand the story we're telling ourselves about what happened and also what really happened because often those two things are not the same, remember? Right? What, what might happen is, for example, let's say I lost my job. I got fired from my job or laid off. That's what happened. I lost my job. The story I may have about the fact that I lost my job might, might sound something like I was unworthy. I was incompetent <coughs> or I did something wrong. Radical acceptance or acceptance can help me get my head around the fact that no, maybe I just lost my job. Maybe it's not about me doing something wrong. So I can rewrite the ending a little bit. Well, we are at the end of our time and um, I'm gonna send you a follow-up chat with some resources that you can tap into, particularly for mental health support. And um, I wanna show you one, one last piece about that as we close. There's one of the resources I'm going to share for you is called the Mental Health Authority, and um, it's a U.S.-based resource for mental health. It has just a plethora of resources that you can access, and this particular piece doesn't come from the Mental Health Authority, but it comes from another um, authority around mental health, and there are so many good resources out there for well-being, both physical and emotional and mental. This one is a campaign called It's Okay Not to Be Okay. And it has some nice little tips. You can't really probably see it too well on this slide about some signs that someone needs support and how you can be supported in terms of mental health. So you will see some resources coming from me and from the chamber in the follow-up um, to help you access resources that you, that you want and that will help you stay upright. So I'm going to close with a final video. And while that video plays, I'm going to stay on the line and I'm willing to stay after for a few minutes um, if you can. And if you have a question and you want a little private support from me or support in a small group, I will stay. But I want to thank you again for showing up, for being here with me and with this group uh, and for the work that you're doing every day. You are enough. So this last uh, little piece that I want to show you is a clip it does feature the amazing Dr. Brown. And um, oops, let me see if I can get it to play, not that one. I'm having lots and lots and lots of thoughts about the power not of OK. One, but it's good. I never worry about the air I breathe in my nose or how the blood gets pumped to my toes. I know I'm young and body able, but how come I feel so unfucking stable? Some days I spend all day inside my head when I know I should be working instead. All I see are eyes, 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 eyes. Are you busy and I? What do they think of me? Am I okay? My head tricks me into thinking I'm one thing when I'm not, and that I should be thankful for what I've got. I've got a good job, I'm not short of a mate. How dare I get myself into this state? Come on, pal, you're Larry, loads of friends, but still my mind goes tick, 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 it never ends. Well, my pals wheel me away when I'm a bit off track. We've got a mentalist here, stand well back. What if it work I tell the big cheesy? It already doesn't make my life that easy. Tell him I like my job, but my thoughts are getting on top of me. Hope he doesn't want to send me away for a full frontal lobotomy. I know by law it's confidential, but will that stop the whispers? Psst, guess who's mental? Or maybe I'd tell him that I think. I think, I think, I think I just won't tell him anything. I just need some time, okay? One thought I thought is maybe most people think the same things I think, and that I should ask them how they feel, instead of worrying about my thoughts for real. Maybe most people have this period, a peak, a dip, and realise life is a series of episodes, not one long clip. And maybe in the omnibus of your life, today is a shite one. And you just need someone to know where you're coming from. A nod, a smile, are you okay? Because in my thoughts and thoughts and thoughts, I've thought about asking you. And I hope when my shite day comes, you'll return the favour too. It seems so small, but it's a powerful thing to say. That's the power. The power of... Are you okay? Beautiful. So I see we still have some people on. And I'm going to stay on until 1.15 in case you have another question, you want to chat about it, uh, you can raise your hand. And um, that's a little clip from a campaign in the UK about mental health. And I'm going to share a couple more resources for you in the follow up. Thank you again to the Oregon Health Council and the Chamber for sponsoring this work. And um, keep being you, keep showing up, you're doing it. You're doing it. I'm just noticing if there's other questions. 
do feel free to ask and thank you for coming. Mm. Yeah, there's a, somebody's asking a great question about feeling guilty if people are showing you compassion and um, that, you know, we all have things going on. And so when people are offering to help you, if you have personal things going on, it can be easy to feel guilt, guilty about that. And my recommendation is to shine on your self-compassion, right? Because um, just because other people are having a hard day doesn't mean you don't get to have a hard day. We sometimes call that comparative shaming. Like my bad is not as bad as your bad. And the reality is bad is bad. So I recommend that you stay grounded in, in your story. And if your team is being compassionate because you've got a lot going on personally, that's okay. Let them receive that help and support. And on another day, you may be the one that's providing the support for someone else. So this is a lot about self-compassion and changing the narrative that says that you have to always um, be the one that's strong. And that if people are offering to help, it means they have something to give and they're there for you, which is such a powerful feeling. So thank you, great question, great question. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the chamber. Look for the follow up and um, keep me posted on how it's going out there. We are we are post crisis in a new phase of COVID and um, we are learning together how to do it because the script hasn't really been written. Uh, I really appreciate your coming. Um, and being here today. If there's no more questions, I think I will sign off. <laughs>